are Confessional Magazine. I am Taywow, and this is More to the Story, brought to you today by Iris and Bo, whose toner helps keep my laugh lines in check, because you never know what our guests are going to say. Visit irisandbo.com today and use code CONFESSIONAL for 20% off. So much love in this heart of mine. Confessional Magazine. I'm Taylor and I'm here today with the wonderfully talented music composer, film composer, Stacy Widelitz. Thank you for joining me, Stacy. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so Stacy, you have worked on so many films and with so many just different amazing people, one of them being Patrick Swayze, and you and him together wrote She's Like the Wind. Yes. Um the interesting thing is we actually didn't write it for Dirty Dancing. We wrote it uh, two years before the movie was shot. For a diff- we wrote it for a different movie, and it wasn't used in that, but we did a really good demo. And then Patrick uh, played the demo for the producers and director of Dirty Dancing when he was on the set in North Carolina, and they wanted to use it. So uh, it was uh, a little bit of a fateful thing because at the time, nobody thought the movie was going to do anything. It was The word on the street was it was going to be in the theaters for a week and then disappear into video. And Which is wild, right? Yeah. Looking back, it's yeah. the mo- I mean, it's one of the most famous movies ever. <laughs> yes, and, and it was a worldwide hit. The soundtrack was a worldwide hit, and it became iconic and almost, almost like a rite of passage for young women. You yeah. know, it's like when they turn 15 years old, that's when they get permission to watch Dirty Dancing. You know, so it's, it's, <laughs> right. it's very funny. Yeah, I remember actually I was in South Carolina visiting my aunt and I was about 15 and my mom probably still would have not approved for me to watch it. But my aunt was like, it's your time. You get to watch this. <laughs> um, so you, how did you meet Patrick? We met in his acting class initially. Uh, this was in 1983. He was a student in a class called the Beverly Hills Playhouse, run by a teacher named Milton Katselis. And a friend of mine at the time wanted to do a, um, a scene from a musical, uh, from the musical Shenandoah, and he knew that I was a, a good accompanist on the piano. So he asked me if I would play for him in the class. So I said, sure. So we rehearsed it, and then we did uh, the, uh, the scene in the class, and uh, the class was probably about 60, 65 students, uh, including at that time, a very young Alec Baldwin, Tom Selleck was in the class, uh, Patty Davis Reagan, uh, or Patty Reagan Davis, uh, Reagan's daughter, um, <laughs> who up uh, Mimi Rogers, it was amazing. So it- What a crew. Yeah. <laughs> so when we finished the scene, it turned into a discussion with the teacher, Milton, and the class about theater and music in theater. And it, and I participated in the discussion. And as I was packing up my music after all this, uh, the class took a break and this guy came over and he had this kind of husky Texas accent. And he said, hi, I'm Buddy, which is how I knew him. Everybody, friends or family called him Buddy. And he said, I really liked your playing and your talk about, um, you know, theater and all this. And we were talking briefly. And then I said, you know, you look really familiar. So he said, well, did you see The Outsiders? And I said, no. And then he said, uh, have you seen Renegades? And I said, no. And he mentioned a couple of other things I haven't seen. So he's already getting annoyed at this point. And, <laughs> and so I said, you know, it's not that kind of familiar. It's like I've seen you around familiar. And then this blonde woman came over and he introduced her as his wife, Lisa. And I said, okay, now I've got it. The two of you are always working on a black 240Z on La Jolla Avenue on the weekends. And so they said, yeah, how do you know that? And I said, I live right around the block from you. So we live two houses away from each other. That is wild. And, and I was living at the time with my um, girlfriend who was a great singer named Wendy Fraser, who actually sings on the final version of She's Like the Wind. Uh, and um, the four of us just started hanging out. We became friends. And, uh, and 
I was writing music for television at that point, which he knew. And when this opportunity came up to submit a song for this other film, Grandview USA, he uh, called me and said, I've had this song idea floating around for a while, but I can't get anywhere with it. Do you want to work on it? And so I said, yeah, sure. Come on over since right around the block. So he walked over with his guitar and I was at the piano and um, he sang me the first lines that he had um he only had two chords at that point like c to e minor but oh. he had the, he had the opening lines she's like the wind through my tree she rides the night next to me which i liked and then i didn't like the third and fourth lines so he said well what would you write and i said well she leads me through moonlight only to burn me with the sun and he said what does that mean and i said i don't care let's just write it down and uh, and we were off and, and running. And, you know, over the next two or three nights, we pretty much had it hashed out and then did the demo of it. That is just amazing. So it was originally for uh, Grandview USA. Yeah. And fortunately, it got it wasn't used in that. Uh, so then the song sat in a drawer uh, for two years until he played it. Um, on the set of uh, Dirty Dancing. I mean, it, it fits just so well. I can't, now, you can't imagine the movie without that song. <laughs> yeah, they found a great scene for it. The way, the way and it, it's funny, years later, I met a guy here in Nashville, who's a music editor and fine composer himself named Joseph DeBeezy. And he said, you know, in a way, we've worked together before. And I said, how? And he said, I was the music editor on Dirty Dancing and I cut your song into the movie. So that, <laughs> that was a funny coincidence. I love those small world moments. Those are, yeah. it's just, it's really cool. And I feel like once you get into this, you kind of like, you probably come across that often that like you've worked with someone that's worked with someone or they'll think of you because they had worked with you in the past. And it's just, it's a cool community that can start yeah. to build. Yeah. Um, so you and your partner at the time and Patrick and Lisa would go and I know that they were both pilots right can you tell right. me about do you have any adventures of you know your time on the planes yeah. with them or anything yeah that was later um they got their pilot's license well he got his first then she got hers um I think in the early 90s and by that point Wendy and I had split up but I was living with uh, an actress uh, named Karen Richmond, who had been a uh, Gidget in the show, the new Gidget. <laughs> anyway, so Karen did not like small planes, and but I did. And this is before uh, Buddy and Lisa bought their own plane. So he called me up one afternoon and Karen and I were living in uh, Venice, California, right near Santa Monica Airport. So, um, he called me and he said, hey, Lisa and I are renting an airplane um, and we're going to fly to Santa Barbara for dinner. We could swing by Santa Monica Airport, pick you up, and then the four of us can go have dinner. So I said, well, that, that sounds great to me. I had to do a little convincing <laughs> of Karen because, again, she didn't care for us. And she said, he just got his license. I said, yeah, but he's, he's the most obsessive compulsive person. He's could go through that checklist five times I guarantee it so they pick us up at Santa Monica airport it's late afternoon and um so it was still light out and we flew up to Santa Barbara and there was a car at the airport and we drove to this restaurant and had dinner and it was you know just great it was you know how often do you get to do that and um but by this time now it's dark mm -hmm. and so we get in the plane to go back home and Santa Monica airport is in the middle of Santa Monica, which is chock full of lights and buildings and houses and streets. And we were all on headphones. Karen and I were in the back seat. And I distinctly heard him say to Lisa over the, you know, the headphones, I think that's the runway. <laughs> and Karen gripped my arm and said, did he just say what I think he said? And so I leaned forward and I said, you, you do know where the, the runway is, don't you? 
And I, he, I said, don't, don't land us on Ocean Park uh, Boulevard, please. And um, so finally he did, you know, manage to find the runway and, and land us. But on, in the car on the way back to the house, Karen just turned, he says, never, ever ask me to do something like that again, ever. So it, it, was, it was very funny. I mean, and now that's got to be like one of the best memories that you could possibly have, right? You do it again yeah. in a heartbeat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was great. And I knew he was, you know, uh, a, a very responsible guy in terms of how he handled things. So it was it was just very funny. Yeah. So, Stacey, where did you get your start in, in the music industry, like in this whole world of, you know, where'd you start? <laughs> I, I, I started really as, as a kid. Um, I, I started piano when I was eight years old after flunking out of the band program in <laughs> elementary school. The, uh, I, I was assigned the flute, which I couldn't make heads or tails of. And the band director finally sent me home after about a month with a note to my parents that said, um, please return Stacy's flute. I'm dropping him from the band program as he exhibits no <laughs> musical ability whatsoever. So, but... Then we got an old piano and that made more sense to me. Uh, and I had a cousin who was a concert pianist and he gave me my first lesson. But then when I was about 13 or so, I decided I wanted to be a musician, much to my parents' consternation. And um, when I was 15, I was in a, a band, like a lounge band, piano, bass, sax, and drums. And we played jazz stuff and standards, you know, like Girl from Ipanema and stuff like yeah. that. And we got hired to play at a, a club um, when I was 15 uh, called the, um, the Executive Suite at the, uh, um, oh no, the Port Royal Room. That was at the Port Royal Room. And uh, this being Long Island at the time, everything was mafia owned. <laughs> and um, it was a place that served alcohol. So I was supposed to be 18. The other guys in the band were. And the manager of the place at the audition said, he looks a little young. And they were saying, oh, he's, and they said, I don't care how old he is. He just needs a piece of paper that says that he's 18. So when I told my father, who had a background in commercial art, how much the uh, restaurant was going to pay us, uh, for Fridays and Saturday nights, which was a lot for a kid at that time, he went downstairs into the basement with my birth certificate and altered it. <gasps> and, uh, you couldn't tell. I still have it to this day. So he made me three years older and we presented it to the uh, restaurant. The guy said, fine, as long as you have the paper, I don't care. <sighs> and so that, that was my start. That's amazing. I mean, what great parental support, right? Yeah. Well, again, you know, it, it was, um, he, he said, how much are they going to pay you? And I said, $40. And he said, $40 for the band for the night. So said, no, $40 a man. So $40 for the two nights. And I said, no, $40 a night. So he said, you're going to come home after two nights with $80. And so I said, yeah. And he said, hang on. And that's when he went down to the basement. <laughs> I love that story so much. <laughs> um, so when the, with this band, the other guys were 18, you're 15. How did you even meet? How did you meet these guys? In high school, in, in, in high school. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we all went to high school together. Do you keep in touch with any of them? I, yeah, I'm actually in touch with all of them. That's uh, awesome. Which is amazing. Uh, one I had lost touch with for a long time, but we're, we're back in touch, the drummer. He became a lawyer. And, uh, but what then happened was, you know, my thinking was, okay, I'm going to be a jazz pianist or a studio pianist or all this. And when I was about 19 or 20, I was studying jazz piano with a guy in uh, Westchester County named Lou Stein, who it turned out had written a bunch of jingles and things like this and became very well to do from that and at and uh he had a besides my lessons he had a monday night jazz workshop that i was writing music for uh and um we'd perform it out live sometimes 
And so at one of the lessons, uh, walking back to my car, he looked at me and he said, you know, you're, you're a really good piano player, but I think you're a better composer. And I think that's your path. I think that um, you won't have to tour, you'll make more money, you'll get more respect. And I think that that's the way for you. And I was already doing some work for a little recording studio in Connecticut, uh, some little scoring jobs. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so on the drive, on the way, I about an hour drive back from my lesson. And it was like the, you know, the skies opened with the, ah, you know, and, and I realized he was right. And that's where I started to focus my, my energy. So what would you say was your like first break? First break was when I was 24 and living with Wendy at that point. And um, her father was a television producer and he gave us a shot at a new show that he had. And, but he said, I'm not just giving it to you. Um, he had heard music of mine that he liked very much, mm -hmm. but he wanted the two of us to work on it together, which is right. I mean, and, and she turned out to be a really talented uh, writer. Um, but uh, he said, I have to like what you come up with. My wife has to like it because she's co-producing. The star has to like it and the syndicator has to like it. If you can satisfy all four of those, you got it. And we did it. And um, it was a new show that he had called the Richard Simmons Show. Oh, never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, it was That's amazing. Five, yeah, it was on five days a week. Yeah. And so it debuted and it became a hit over a period of a few months. And Wendy and I started talking and we were living in Astoria, Queens at this point. And we realized that, okay, to really capitalize on this, we're going to have to move to California. Mm. And which was a, a tough thing for me with family and friends all in New York. Uh, but it, it was the right move. So we packed up and moved the, ne the next year when I was 25. But that was my first national credit. And that did serve as leverage into the business. We, we booked another TV thing within three weeks of arriving in L.A. So <laughs> that's almost unheard of. I mean, that's a good, good groundwork on you, on you then before heading out there. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And our, our first meeting for it was on at the Burbank NBC lot. And, you know, we were new to LA, so we had to figure yeah. out how to get there. And we did and the security guard let, has our name and, you know, tells us where to park. And as we're walking to this office, a blue Mercedes convertible went by with Johnny Carson driving. And I turned to Wendy and I said, we are in Hollywood. We are in LA in the midst of the business. So it was, it was, um, it was fun. And that, that show was, um, it didn't last long. It lasted about eight months, but it was a talk show with Regis Philbin starring. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is all nice. just so cool. So what would you say is your like favorite thing to compose for would you rather do for a tv show or a movie do you have a preference um the the shows that i found the most fun to work on uh i did like 21 movies of the week for the networks and uh which was a lot and um but i worked on a show at one point called eerie indiana which was on nbc for a, a couple of years a couple of seasons and uh uh, I did, I think, five or six episodes for that. And the show was like a cross between the Twilight Zone and the Wonder Years. So I could get very imaginative with yeah. the music and get really, you know, interesting harmonies and chord patterns and, you know, very eerie stuff. And I loved that. Show. I loved working on that show. And the guys I was working with on that were, were great. And uh, I also did some documentaries for ABC World of Discovery, which were mostly nature. And I loved those two. I did four of them, one of which I got nominated for an Emmy for. And um, uh, that one was on the plight of the black rhinoceros. And, uh, but it was a great show, just a, an absolutely fantastic show. So- um, I those, never, those 
I had never even, you know, it's so interesting to me because, you know, you watch a movie or you watch a show, you're not realizing all of this other work that is going into making it this beautiful thing. And a big part of that, a huge part is the music. And I just, how do you, how do you like, how do you get into the zone for writing this? Is it, it just comes naturally or you study a story and then you can write about it? It, it, for me, it was really triggered by the visual that, um, and you, you're working with your own emotion. You watch a scene and you react to it as the composer, you react emotionally in a certain way. And then you try to convey that emotion to the audience through what you write. And that can be, you know, done, you know, it can be sad, it can be fun, it can be this, but it's, it's, um, it's actually incredibly hard. It, it's especially in uh, television where you are also under tremendous deadlines. So there's no such thing as writer's block or anything like that. Somebody once asked me, what's, you know, what's your inspiration when you're scoring? And I said, fear. <laughs> so it's, it's just fear of not getting the job done. Yeah. So, and getting it done first too, is yeah. probably like in this game, it's like, just a lot of, a lot of pressure, but do you ever get finished with something and then you're like, okay, I'm done, but what did I just write? Because you go through it so quickly and then you're like, what is this? All, all the time. (laughs) There was one summer, I think it was 97 or 98. I did nine TV movies in one year, which is a lot. And I did three in a row over the course of a summer. One for NBC, one for CBS, one for ABC, but all for the same producers. One was called Abduction of Innocence. One, the other one, uh, the CBS one, which was a great movie actually, was called A Child's Wish. And then the ABC one was really strange called Nobody Lives Forever. And I went from one right into the other, right into the other. So the producers, when we were wrapping up the third one, uh, this guy, Michael O'Hara said to me, he said, how did how did you do this? And I said, I made them all one movie called (laughs) A Child's Innocent Wish to Be Abducted and Live Forever. So (laughs) put all the titles together, even though they were actually, fortunately, very, very different. Otherwise, it would have been more difficult. Uh, But yeah, it's, it's, there are times you're just like, what did I just do? Yeah. So are you working on any, any projects now, Stacey? Not right now. I, I, kind of stepped back from the scoring work the the business of that changed um enormously especially with streaming services Mm -hmm. uh to be honest the money that you get isn't what it used to be and um so i'm still you know doing some songwriting but the the big focus of my energy over the past few years has been photography which is a new a new thing for me that's great what do you what do you what do you photograph um, I do street photography, like classic black and white street photography. Uh, what happened was in 2015, I was set to go to um, Tuscany, a, a town right outside of Florence for a songwriter workshop that a friend of mine had put together uh, and was being conducted by one of my favorite songwriters, uh, Gretchen Peters. And um, you know, it had this great itinerary and it was all at this villa, uh, which, you know, is sounds awful with cooking classes, <laughs> trips out into the countryside. And, and uh, you know, I always did travel photography, but never thought much of it. But for this trip, it was my first time to Italy and I decided I was going to get a better camera. Mm-hmm. So I bought kind of this mid-level Sony travel camera that had a built-in Zeiss zoom lens, actually excellent lens. And when I was playing around with it, uh, I saw that it had this black and white function. And I've always loved old black and white photos like Cartier Bresson, and I'm really a nut for old black and white movies. Things like The Third Man or uh, Citizen Kane or any of the film noir stuff. I love those movies and the look and the feel of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, I started taking pictures of people uh, in black and white, you know, in in cafes or on the streets and all this. 
And what happened was I posted a few to uh, Facebook. And when I got home from Italy, I was walking my dog and there's a great photographer who lives around the block from me and we're Facebook friends. So he stopped his car and he said, were you posting archival photos from Italy? And I said, no, if you mean the black and white stuff, I took those. So he said, you took those photos. So I said, yeah. And so he said, well, they're really good. You need to keep doing that. So I did. I, I then think the next year I went to Cuba and any place I went, I took the camera. And um, finally, I was back in Italy in March of 2018. And when I got back, I decided to have a couple printed out just to see what they looked like on real, professionally done on good paper. Mm -hmm. And I did, when I went to pick them up at this, this place called Chromatics, uh, there's a woman there and she's peering at me as I'm looking at the photo saying, wow, these look great. And she said, did you take these? And I said, yeah. And so she said, do you have more like this? And I said, a, a ton, I've been traveling for four years now or three years. So she said, you need to buy a portfolio and start printing out more photos and put a portfolio together because you're onto something. And so I did, um, got about 15 photos put together showed them to a friend of mine who at that time was the curator for an arts, um, arts venue here in town called Oz Arts. And she saw them and said, you need a one man show of your work. And I said, you're kidding, that, that can't be possible. She says, no, I'm telling you at one of the good galleries downtown Nashville. So I said, well, I know Ann Brown who has the arts company, which is one of the best and biggest galleries. So, she said, call her. So I called Anne, I'd known her quite a number of years. And Anne was very dubious, you know, with this guy, you know, he's, and I'm saying, yeah, I've been taking pictures. And, and she's like, mm, okay, send me a few via email. And uh, so I sent her uh, three or four photos and she texted me that afternoon saying, impressive and in a very particular way, uh, let's set up a meeting. So I went in to meet with her, took, took the portfolio, which was funny because she said, put the portfolio on that table. You sit over there and don't say anything. <laughs> I want to look through these without commentary. And um, it's totally analogous to the way I would handle a music situation. So she looked through and she turned to me and she said, tell me again how this happened. And I said, basically, I bought a new camera. And so she said, well, what do you want to do now? And I said, I don't know. Lauren told me that I should have a show, but that seemed a little outlandish. And so Anne said, no, I'm, I'm going to do your show. I'm going to do a show of your work. And um, she said, I'm, I'm telling you, your work is incredible. So I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. And the next year we put together, this was in June of 2019, a one-man show of about 15 of my pieces called, um, we called it Second Act, was the name of the show. And um, uh, Anne has since retired, and that gallery has become another gallery called Chauvet Arts, but they're still representing me as an artist. And to my amazement, four of my pieces have sold. That's incredible. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it was just stunning to me that, that um, not only to get the show, but then I, I walked into the gallery one day when it was still the arts company and Anne turned to me and said, oh, did you get your check yet? And I said, check for what? She said, the, the shot of the kids running and Luca sold. And I said, you're kidding. And these weren't like $50 prints. And this was like $1,800, you know, so collectible. And I was, I was amazed. I was just amazed. So it's really become uh, a passion. Uh, and um, if anybody wants to take a look, they can go to my website. Uh, which is relatively new called stacywidelets.com, simple. And it's a mixture of music and stories and photographs and stories about the music, stories about the photographs. And so that's pr probably a big part of the reason why you're finding success with your photography is because you've had to be a storyteller with all yeah. of your composing work. And 
taking a picture is, you know, just another way to tell a story. So you've got, you've got the eye for it then. <laughs> yeah. And, and convey the emotion as well. Mm -hmm. It's all about conveying some sort of emotion. And um, it's, it, it is analogous. And we, in, in the write-up that we did for the gallery show, we brought that out a little bit. Matter of fact, I performed it. We had a, a private opening um, at the end of May for about 75 people that I invited. And I performed a song that I had written in Tuscany at that workshop that was based on a photograph that was in a gravestone. And so it was, it was all interconnected. That's amazing. I mean, you're very, very talented in so many different ways, but the, like the fact that you can like kind of tie them all together is just very, very special. It's very cool. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fun, and also you know I get bored easily, so it's uh, it's 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 good. You're staying busy. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Stacy, I know you said that we can find you at your website, which is www.stacywidelitz.com, right. and. Are you anywhere else on social media that anybody can find you? Yes, on Instagram, I'm, that's where I post black and white photos. I use it only for that, not for shots of the dinner that I made. And <laughs> uh, that's at Stacy Weidlitz, all one word, uh, S-T-A-C-Y-W-I-D-E-L-I-T-Z. And um, uh, there it's, you know, uh, posting like every few days, it could be something that I just took. Um, it could be something from a few years ago. I have a shot that I really like. Of, we had this snowstorm, which is unusual here, uh, about a month ago. And I have a great shot at night of my dog walking through the snow in the backyard with these weird shadows from the lights. So it's, um, uh, it's that's a fun thing. And, and I've met I now have over 900 followers and I've met a lot of photographers from around the world that way. And, and actually I was invited to join a Facebook group called Inspired Street Photography and they have curators or administrators that judge photos. And yeah. the first, first photo that I posted in there was a shot of a young woman I got in Berlin and they singled it out and made it one of the, the photos of the month. That's incredible. I mean, it's just, it's fun to find these communities of other artists too, that then yeah. you're like sharing within and inspiring each other and building off of each other's success and creativity. Yeah. Very cool. I can't wait to check out all your photos and everything. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to, to see what you think. It's, yeah. My, bro my brother-in-law is a photographer in New York City and it's always just so interesting how, you know, you can have two photographers looking at the exact same thing and they are completely different pictures. Yeah. And that's just so cool. It's just, it's, it's really an amazing art. <laughs> well, one of my favorite um, artists in the world is Picasso. And he had a great, there's a great um, series of drawings by him at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, California. That first one is a very realistic pencil drawing pencil or pen, I can't remember, of a bull. The next drawing is the same bull, but now deconstructed. And he goes through geometrically. And it shows you that he could see this same animal in 12 different ways and draw it in 12 different ways. And it's, it's astonishing. I was always amazed staring at that saying, you know, how, did, how is he able to do that? That's, you know, it's, it's amazing. The mind is an incredible place. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, everybody's story is different. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story with me today, Stacy. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> sure. Thank you. It's, uh, of course. It's, I, was, I was a little worried at first when I saw confessional and I thought, okay, what is she going to pry out of me here? <laughs> so, uh, um, I do want to ask you five years from now, I like, I like to ask this question to everybody. What's your five year dream was your, your five year in five years what do you or where do you see yourself what would you where do you want to be I think I would be spending more time in Europe you know uh I I haven't been to Spain yet this past year has been so hard to not be able to travel uh because you know I went to London and Berlin in 2019 which was great and um then it just 
stop dead. But I'd like to spend maybe, you know, three, four months of the year uh, floating around Europe with my dog, if he can deal with the flight. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that, that would be really fun, just taking pictures, still writing music, um, you know, because it's fun when you travel also, like I've gone to Denmark to write with, you know, songwriters, so, which is a lot of fun. So, but that, that's kind of what I, what I picture. I mean, I love that. And I, I just have to know because I'm such a dog person myself, what kind of dog do you have and what's his name? <laughs> his name is Max. He just, he just looked at me. He's, oh. uh, <laughs> uh, he, um, he's a rescue that I, I got about two and a half years ago. And at first I thought he was some sort of strange mutt, but in researching a dog that I thought he kind of looked like, which is an Ibizan hound, a picture popped up of a Spanish hunting dog called a Minetto hound. And it was his twin, other than the <laughs> color of the coat. And they're very distinctive. Hey, Max, come here. Come here. <laughs> oh, hi, Max. <laughs> so he's he's got adorable. The, I love he's got, he's got the Yoda ears. ears. Yeah, it's like a radar station. And he's got light colored eyes and a pinkish nose. Oh, and uh, he's very sweet. <laughs> and so he, it, it was just strange to find out that, in fact, he's like this rare breed of dog that somehow ended up on the street in Huntsville, Alabama, where he was picked up. But he's, yeah. he's, he's a good dog. Good. I mean, nothing's better than having your dogs around. I mean, you might have heard mine barking throughout this. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, Stacy, again, it was so nice to, to meet you, first of all, and hear your story. And just, I, it's just so much fun to meet people that have been on such a journey like yours. And it's continuing. It's not going anywhere. Now you've got this new photography journey that I just, I can't wait to follow along with that too. So I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. and or to your comments on them so let me yeah know. absolutely absolutely um thank you again everybody please check out stacy stacy stub at his website his instagram stacy widelitz thank you again this is confessional magazine i'm taylor and there's always more to the story thanks stacy <laughs> thank you bye bye so much love in this heart of mine.